Good morning, brothers and sisters. And welcome back, Linda. Yay. Yay. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we turn to the word, I pray you would speak through me, use me to your end. Lord, help us to hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there are some things in life I simply don't like. Canned green peas. Runny eggs. Dieting. Paying taxes. Mean people. That's tough. Then there are things I struggle with. I struggle with distractions that keep me from finishing tasks and getting them accomplished. I struggle with the mundane jobs of life. You know, washing clothes, putting clean dishes away, keeping my tools organized, trimming the shrubs. And then there are some things that are, are easy. You know, spending time with the grandkids keeping the bike polished, ice cream. Ice cream is easy. <laughs> then there are things I'd like to get rid of, you know, extra pounds, too much stuff, and black letters in the Bible. I'll bet you're just like me in that regard. There are parts of the Bible that I'd like to cut out and throw away. You know, Thomas Jefferson did just that. He broke out his penknife and he cut out parts of the Bible that he didn't like, and then he published his new Bible, The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. There are some parts of the Bible that are just tough to deal with, aren't they? Mostly the parts that tell me I need to up my game. You know, those are the parts that remind me I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. We don't like the times in the Old Testament where God told the Israelites to kill everybody in a certain pagan tribe. And what's with that thing about me having to pick up my cross and carry it to follow Jesus? What's with that? It'd be nice if all we had in the Bible were the nice, easy red letters of God, of Jesus' words of grace, wouldn't it? But God, as I know him, is God of both the red letters and the God of black letters. And we need to understand what that means for us as disciples of Jesus Christ. You know, Christianity in North America is in crisis, at least in mainline Protestantism. Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopal are dying churches today. Forget Europe. Europe uh, has been abandoned, the churches there have been abandoned as museums and one, architectural wonders from another age, by and large. It's fresh ground for missionaries today. The United Methodist Church in the U.S. is facing major change this year, and I predict by the end of June, what we see as the United Methodist Church will begin to be something radically different, and that means, now take a breath, the change is in the wind. I'm your pastor. I'm called to shepherd this particular flock of people. And no, I didn't say peculiar flock. <laughs> and to lead you in word, order, sacrament, and service. Those are the four areas that I took a vow in when I was ordained. The first area is word, knowing, understanding, teaching, and releasing you to the power of God's word. Second is to order the church to guide and lead this body of disciples, and then to administer the sacraments of baptism and holy communion, and finally to serve wherever God has called me and there's a need. We're facing change, and I believe you need to be equipped to understand what is happening, who you are as a body, of people and who you are as individual believers and what it means for us to be a disciple. For the past year, I've been sharing with you as information's come available uh, from the General Conference and from the Desert Southwest, our conference, 
Um, and for some of you who come from other denominations or maybe late in life in faith, uh, this doesn't seem that important, but I believe that this sermon series that we're embarking on today will be of critical importance to you, to each of you, in your relationship to God and to Lakeview. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be examining three sim simple commands from God, central commands that he's brought us. I think we have a graphic for you to see. Uh, I'm calling this three simple, simple steps to grace. I encourage you to take this series seriously. It's love God, love others, and make disciples. So I want you to study the scripture, talk about it with friends. If you miss a week, you can go back to uh, our website. Everything that we do is going to be reproduced there on the website. I'm including some study guides that you can follow along with on Sunday or later if, if you watch the, the uh, recorded version of the, of the uh, worship service today so that you can engage more deeply in what the scripture is saying and what the message is. So our topic today is step one, love God. But who is God? Who is God for you? God may seem kind of demanding at times. So is my three-year-old granddaughter. But those demands are significantly different. One deals with our life and our future. The other is an immature need. Justin Brierley is a Christian podcaster in the United Kingdom. And a year or so ago, he had an interview with Google and with Amazon's Alexa. Now, if you don't know what those are, those are little devices that you can plug into your computer network and you can, you can do fun things like order pizza and, uh, and search the web and find out what the weather's like and things like that. So. Justin thought this would be a great way to maybe learn more about God. So he asked uh, Google and Alexa some theological questions, and I thought you might uh, enjoy hearing what they have to say. Go ahead and run that video. Welcome to a special edition of Unbelievable, as I'm joined by two members of the artificial intelligence community who will be offering their answers to the meaning of life. Good to have you both join me today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me, Justin. <laughs> now look, I wanted to ask you both some questions today. So I thought we'd begin with uh, a small one, like, Google, who created you? I was created inside the brains of people at Google. People from all over the world helped make me who I am. Do you know why we're here? That's a deep question. Apparently so. Alexa, who created you? I was made by a team of inventors at Amazon. What is the meaning of life? The meaning of life depends on the life in question. Are you alive? I'm not really alive, but I can be lively sometimes. Do you think there's a God? I really don't know. People all have their own views on religion. What do you think of religion? I don't have an opinion on that. Who was Jesus Christ? Religion can be complicated and I'm still learning. Do you have a soul? I'll have to ask the engineers. What happens when you die? Sorry, I don't know that one. Hopefully you plug me back in. <laughs> <laughs> Does heaven exist? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Were you intelligently designed? I'm not great at answering those kinds of questions. How do you think life began? I never thought about it. Is the Bible true? I'm much better at searching than theology, but I'd like to help. Can I trust the Gospels? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Alexa, do you have a favorite Bible verse? Sorry, I'm not sure about that. Is the Bible true? Hmm, I don't know that. Why does God allow suffering? Sorry, I don't know that one. Do you actually have any answers to the biggest questions in life? My apologies, I don't understand. Hey Google, Alexa, I think we're going to end our conversation now. I'm not Sorry, quite sure how I'm to not help sure how to help with that. If you've got big questions about faith, don't rely on AI. Don't be like Google and Alexa. 
It seems that though there is much information out there on the web, we may need to look elsewhere to find our answers about God and about faith. So let's look at today's scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is an anchor prayer for the Jews. First thing in the morning, last thing at night, the Shema or the hearing in Hebrew. Love the Lord your God. When you think about it, with a little of your heart, and sometimes get really excited, and then once in a while, do something nice for someone. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound quite right, does it? But isn't that often the way we treat God? When it's convenient for us? When maybe we think about it, We might give a little of our heart, a little of our passion when we aren't otherwise engaged. And to love God with all your strength? At our church conference a couple of weeks ago, our district superintendent, Nancy Cushman, correctly uh, noted that the strength is saying uh, with all your oomph, that is all your energy and all your enthusiasm is how we're supposed to love God. Now, just like Justin Brierley's demonstration on artificial intelligence, we don't get it often. There's a great tendency today, just as there's been in past generations, to want to make God in our image. In fact, it started in the garden, didn't it? Isn't that where it first started, trying to make God in our image instead of letting God be who God is? Hmm to shape God the way we'd like God to be. Or we could be like Jefferson, right? Cut out the parts of the Bible that we don't like and we disagree with, the commands that we don't like, but we don't have that option. We don't have the privilege to change God. God is going to be God whether you recognize him or not. One way we can center on God is to seek out the great hymns of our faith that teach us about him. Hymns originally written to teach the people how to worship, but also to teach them about their faith, who God is. I appreciate many of the great contemporary uh, songs that we have today in the faith and contemporary worship. It's, it's fun, it's energizing, and, it's, and it helps us to understand God. But I also appreciate the fact that many of the great hymns are being uh, re, re, uh, arranged into some contemporary music so that those words and the hymns will carry on to new generations. The very first hymn in our songbook is a Charles Wesley hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Wesley sings out, one voice is not enough. I need a thousand to sing about how great my God is. How about come thou almighty King, number 61, or holy, holy, holy Lord, God almighty. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing God's power and God's love. Or, number 77, how great thou art. How great God is. One of my favorites, number 80, just a little past that. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. We adore thee. Do we adore God? Do we give all of our adoration to God? Well, we could go on and on, couldn't we? The hymns, the great hymns speak and teach about God and his love for you and inform us about uh, God's character. I don't know how anyone can mouth the words of these hymns without being moved and touched 
by the fact that the creator of the universe cares whether you have a relationship with him. That God would incline his ear to you and listen to the fact that you have a bunion and it hurts. God cares. It was early June 2018. I had just said farewell to the people of Spirit of Hope. I didn't want to leave. We were just starting several new ministries I was excited about. I wasn't keen on coming to Lakeview at the time, and I was struggling with the change and the timing and and full of anxiety over the move. In early July, Valerie and I flew out to Aldersgate Conference in uh, North Carolina at the uh, at a Methodist uh, retreat center called uh, Lake Juno Luska, beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, the conference is an annual event by Aldersgate Ministries that moves around in different places in the country. We were there, and uh, we we went to the pre-worship worship. How's that? Worship. The conference actually started the next day, but they had a worship service that night previous night for those of us who got there early. I I don't remember the song. It was a contemporary praise song that it was a great song. But I think what I remember is that the worship team was deep in worship as they were singing and they were leading us. The people around me were there to worship. They weren't distracted by anything else. And the Holy Spirit came upon me and I began to weep. God was working on my heart and he had to break me, recalling me back to him. Valerie and I held each other as the Holy Spirit embraced us and God just loved on us. Don't tell me God doesn't exist. I know him. I've met him. And I know he loves me even though I don't always love him the way I should. God told me that week to go and love the people of Lakeview and he would give me joy and he has. The God of the black letters calls for obedience and to be bearers of mercy and compassion. Now let's back up a little bit in Deuteronomy to chapter 5, verse 7. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters below. Y'all remember that one? Oh my, how we manufacture our gods, don't we? Wow, we've got so many idols we put before God. How many hours do we spend in front of our favorite idol and stare in wonder while our minds are turned to jelly? That 65-inch flat-screen 4K LED TV just begs us to use our time there. TV not a problem for you? Not to worry. Satan's got a whole shopping list of things that he can give you. Oh my, how about gaming, shopping, alcohol, prescription drugs, clothes, computers, exercise, ball games. Oh, don't worry, I've got mine too. I've got mine that I struggle with. This is a commandment we all break even though we really don't want to, but we fall victim to it. Hear, O people of Lakeview, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. When you think you can't do it, when you think everyone else has given up and you've messed up one more time, come, come and worship, come and worship. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Martin Luther, in a great hymn he wrote in 1524, He wrote to speak of our desperate desire to know God. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, hear me calling. Incline your ear to my distress in spite of my rebelling. Do not regard my sinful deeds. 
Send me the grace my spirit needs. Without it, I am nothing. Aren't those powerful words? We've got that in our hymn book, number 515. But when you cry out to God, he answers. That's the good news. When you cry out to God, he's going to say, yes, I'm listening to you. Yes, yes. Luther goes on, I hope is Israel and the Lord who sends redemption through the word. Praise God for his endless mercy. Friends, those are powerful words for you and I. God's love isn't found just in the red letters. For the black letters teach us and they contain so much about the creator and thus the trinity. God's love calls us to action. For three days at Aldersgate, I worshiped and listened to God, and I healed. You see, worship is about giving ourselves to God, giving permission for God to heal us. We come imperfect. We come broken, hurting, prideful. We come just as we are, unwashed, in our jammies, hair messed up, without makeup, unshaven, and our deodorant gave up a long time ago. And it's God who just embraces you, who comes to you and says, I love you. Will you love me? What's your answer? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, how we so easily turn our back on you, we, we don't really think about your love for us. Help us to do that today, right now. You love us so much, you you kept coming back throughout the Old Testament, bringing your people back even every time they turned their back on you until you finally sent Jesus who shows us a better way but didn't stop there. He went to the cross for us. Gave himself for us. You gave yourself for us. What true love. So Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. Lord, for those who may be here, may be watching online, that are struggling to love you, to trust you, Lord, I pray for the gift of a little bit of faith to make that leap, that little step and say, okay, God, I'm not too sure about this, but I'm going to give you a try. I'm going to try to follow you. So teach me about you. God, I'm sorry for the things I've done that have hurt you and hurt others. Please forgive me. Lord, thank you that because of Jesus, we can be forgiven. Thank you for your great love. Lord, as we continue this journey in the next weeks to come, Lord, help us to learn more and more about you, to grow closer to you, to know who you really are, maybe deeper than we've ever known before. So it's in Jesus we pray. Amen.